What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Good morning. Great to see you. Good, good. How you doing, Leah? Good, Chief. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. So I, we've had a, an awesome month because uh, this is our anniversary month, you know, one year uh, of, of the show. And uh, we've had so many wonderful guests. And so I I can tell you m myself, I've ate my fair share of cake, um, probably food. <laughs> I don't think you want to say that with a doctor on. Well, I, I, I'm going to get there. I'm, I'm going to, I'm wrapping it up. Right. So, uh, yeah, I have my fair share of cake and beverages that make me smile for absolutely no reason. Uh, and then when we had Mark on, Mark said that he had to bulk up for a movie role. And I felt like me and Mark both had to bulk up for a movie role. And so, so I started probably eating a lot more McDonald's than I should, but, uh, but there, there's no better way to close out a celebratory month than having talking to a doctor to get my mind, body, and spirit back on track. So, and we have one of the, the most well-known doctors on the planet with us today. So without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. You got it, Chief. Uh, today's guest has won an incredible 10 daytime Emmys for his talk show. He's a heart surgeon who has written more than 400 original publications, book chapters, and medical books. He's here today to discuss wellness, sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Dr. Mehmet Oz. Hey. Thanks for having me on. By the way, Chief, I should say that there's nothing healthier I mean, nothing healthier than having a good time with friends. So whether you're with Mark bulking up with him, against him, around him, it's, it's still partying up. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, you know, I feel a lot better about myself now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Dr. Oz, thanks so much for joining us. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from and share your questions and comments for Dr. Oz there too. We'll be reading those live. Now is a great time to start your watch party so you can enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page, you should. Chief Chats are every week and we have military exclusive guests lined up for you into the summer. Absolutely. So Dr. Oz, man, thank you so much for joining Chief Chat today. Well, it's a great plus. I, I love what you guys are doing. I've always respected the armed forces and I appreciate you putting yourselves out uh, on the line all the time. Absolutely. So can you tell our viewers where you're calling in from today? I'm in Florida. It's actually sunny outside. I'm looking out there. I'm getting a little of that vitamin D, which, by the way, is super helpful, especially in, in a time of a pandemic. So I get a little R&R &R down here. Absolutely. I'm pretty jealous of that right now. Yeah. You know? yes. It's like it's going to yes. rain here. We're yeah, in Dallas, Fort Worth. It's Absolutely. not. No vitamin D out there today. So speaking of the pandemic, how have you been do doing during the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, it gets a little lonely sometimes. I think we've all experienced that. And when I say lonely, I mean, I, I, thankfully we have the family. All of us have members that we, you know, that we've been able to stay close to. So in my pod, I've got my four kids and I've got four grandkids. So it makes it fun. But oh, wow. I feel badly that I can't touch base with a lot of my friends. I love traveling and seeing people. And we do these free clinics all over America and, and health fairs. And those we've had to shut down because it's not very healthy to have health fair in the middle of a pandemic. But I got to say, I'm more optimistic now than I have been in a long time. I think vaccine numbers have gone through the roof for over half the country not getting at least one shot. Uh, we actually have a surplus of vaccines in a lot of places. Uh, I was actually driving by a COVID testing center um, here in Florida and it was empty. <laughs> Literally nobody oh, wow. there. Wow. So I think it's a sign that, uh, that people are starting to feel safe and they're doing well overall. We've seen mortality numbers not going up. And then when we have lots of cases, which means that some of the most vulnerable people have gotten protected, your parents and grandparents have gotten their shots now. So um, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that by the middle of the summer, mo most of America will be pretty comfortable going back to normal. Excellent. Glad to hear that. So let's talk about the Dr. Oz show, which has been on the air for more than a decade, has won 10 Emmys, as Julie mentioned earlier. So what's it been like producing the show during the pandemic? And then what measures have you taken to keep your crew safe during these times? Well, like everybody, like every other business, including the military, uh, we had to change a lot. And, you know, I launched a show in 2009. Oprah's my partner, as you know. I had done yeah. her show 60, 70 times. So I, I, I understood a lot about how to talk to people about health, but it was very different talking to people about COVID. 
Uh, it was an intense 24 hour news cycle. There was a lot of news all the time. Sometimes the news came through so quickly, we couldn't attach enough wisdom to it. So you end up reacting to news bits. They were very confusing. Don't wear a mask. Yes, wear a mask. You're a bad person. If you do, you're a bad person. If you don't, I mean, it began to pull on a lot of uh, emotional angst that was already a, a challenging time before that had been started. So for the show, because my program is in dozens and dozens of countries, including in Asia, I knew that the pandemic was real. So we built a home studio. And so in March, we shut down, sent the audience home, sent my team home. We all worked remotely. And my studio from the basement became where I lived for a long periods of time because there was so much intense need for America to, to, to understand, digest, help the information in a way that wasn't intimidating or painful, but actually was a bit uplifting, which is what my show has always been about. Tell you news you need to hear. You might not want to hear about your weight or your diabetes, or your blood pressure, but when I'm done, you're sort of okay with it because you feel empowered by what you learn. And so that um, was, was a path we took till about August. And then we were the first daytime show to sort of say, okay, we're going back for sure in the studio. We're going to launch our next year, our, my 12th year in the studio. We didn't let the audience come back. We tested everybody all the time. Uh, I got tested, you know, at least two times a week, often three times a week because uh, I wouldn't wear a mask when I was actually taping the show. So we wanted to be sure that I didn't have COVID and we didn't really have any outbreaks. We had two people in the entire team of hundred some folk who got tested positive and both of them tested really made, they got it outside the studio. They didn't spread it to anyone inside the studio. And like a lot of other groups, we figured out how to hack the system so we can keep people safe and still make a great show. And I think a lot of America's learned that, which is good news in case there's another pandemic because there will be more infections coming our way in the future years. But I think it's also good news for, even for this pandemic because even if we have variants, a lot of businesses, the government has understood better how to run itself Without having the, without having to shut down, if you do have some infection. Yeah, so so you you brought up a good point as far as like information flow because uh you know in the military we we have a hard time uh because 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 of the advent of social media and how you know you you get information and it goes like wildfire before you even get a chance to research and kind of figure out what's going on. People have already formed their opinion. They already are experts. They're already buying masks or, or throwing away masks. They're already doing the things that, that that the folks that are, you know, are supposed to kind of be the subject matter experts on. You you, you can't even wrap your arms around it before it's already out there. So I just uh, I, I do empathize with with you all in trying to you know educate uh, the, the world on on something that we have never really experienced uh, in my lifetime. Uh, you know, but yeah, social media, man, something goes and it's, it's tough. And then you're trying to do a whole production of a TV show uh, behind that. So you're, you're probably about two days late, at least, you know, at least. But well, we would, we were pretty active on social, as I know, you know, uh, posting just what you're doing, uh, going Facebook live, just trying to be on top of the news. But as Churchill said, the, the lies going around the world before the truth has his pants on. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of what you're doing is just trying to get people to appreciate what the rational path is. And I have access to all the task force members in the prior administration. Now I've talked to a bunch in this administration. So I've, you know, I'm on the president's council of sports, nutrition, and fitness. I, I, I think I've got a pretty good access to information flow. Even the experts disagree sometimes, but there's a bigger challenge is how do you communicate all this to the public? And there's a huge discrepancy about how people feel and see the pandemic because the information they've gotten is very different. Now, if you think that the actual chance of getting hospitalized from the COVID virus is 10 times more than it really is, which is true for about half the country, then you're going to be really scared. Yeah. But then the other half of the country doesn't think you'll ever get sick. Well, that's not true either. And so getting people to realize that this is a bad, bad infection, but one that you can actually do something about, uh, most likely, is news that we, I think is good news and we want to spread that. As an example, I think as a nation, we've done a fantastic job getting a vaccine out that works so much better than any other vaccine we would ever have imagined. I mean, think about this. In the clinical trials, there was not a single person in the Moderna, in the Pfizer, or the JJ trial, not a single person who got vaccinated effectively and then got COVID and died. Not one, not zero. I mean, zero, more than 100,000 people. That's, that's unbelievably good data. But there's the question. If the vaccine works, we ought to act like it works. And that's the challenge now. How do we communicate that to the public, get the people who've been vaccinated comfortable, be fair to people who are still waiting in line to get vaccinated, and then start to get people back on their feet. Now, we have not done such a good job, and that's my show topic this week. Um, I'm thinking, you know, I'm on every day, as you know, but I think it's tomorrow's show. Um, but, I, but the topic is, why don't we do better with just treating 
the early illness. Like when you first get the COVID diagnosis and you're young and you're healthy, you're in the military, you feel good. Are you going to just go home and wait till you get sick? I mean, you don't do that for anything else, right? Absolutely. I mean, I'll just be openly here. You don't, you know, if you have venereal disease, you don't just go home and see how it goes, right? You treat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we ought to be doing that for COVID. We should be getting people in the treatment protocols, but we haven't actually studied. The, our government hasn't invested the effort yet to study a lot of these repurposed medications that might work. We joked about vitamin D earlier. Does vitamin D help with COVID? I mean, there's all kinds of published studies from other countries, but we've never really done a good study figuring out whether it would help you to have a high vitamin D level before you catch the infection or getting it up after you've caught it when you're still not that sick. Giving it to someone who's already in an ICU, you know, just gripping on the, the precipice, uh, you know, about to fall into the abyss of death. You know, that's not a good time to do clinical trials. You want to do it early on. Absolutely. I think that's part of the opportunity for us to get smart about those kinds of things. Absolutely. That was great points. Um, and, and so we're going to shift gears into kind of, you know, kind of stay in the military. We focus on a kind of performance triad, which is sleep, activity, and nutrition. Now, we always hear a lot about eating well, and we always hear a lot about working out, but kind of sleep, sleep kind of goes to the wayside. Uh, and I, I'm probably uh, the worst person to even talk about, you know, sleep because I don't get as much sleep as I feel like I should. Uh, I, we were just talking, uh, uh, you know, I was talking to Leah before you got on there and said, I can't remember like the, the last time I had like a really, really good night's sleep. And so uh, can you, can you kind of stress to us the, the importance of, you know, getting sleep? Well, Will, I, think I, I was talking about with Oprah. I interviewed her last week for her. She's got a great new book coming on. I think that's on Thursday's show. And she was speaking about sleep too. And in, uh, so even someone who's got it all worked out has problems with sleep sometimes. Sleep is the single most underappreciated health problem we have in America. I'll say it again. There is no bigger problem than sleep that we don't even appreciate. I mean, everyone knows food's important. Everyone understands if the exercise works. But think about this. Is there a survival value to lying in your back for eight hours a day? No, right? I mean, evolution would have filtered that right out if it didn't really have some an unbelievably beneficial value to the human body. But because it does, evolution says, even though you're defenseless for a third of the day, take the risk. It's still worth it because you need to be able to clean your brain, which is literally what you do when you sleep. You flush out the neurons, you get rid of waste product, you lay down memories. It helps you with creativity, helps you with muscle regeneration. You actually, I think, will lose weight if you sleep better because when you don't sleep, you crave carbohydrates, you crave food. And so all these are natural benefits. Plus, when you're asleep, you can't eat. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Usually. <laughs> well, so no. <laughs> I've, spent a lot, I've spent a lot of time uh, as a doctor. Uh, being trained not to sleep. When I was a resident, they would help us, you know, help have us work right through the night just so we could learn to make decisions, even if we're exhausted, that are the right decisions for your patient. But it's not the right decision for you. In fact, I, as you know, I launched a bedline, um, the, the Good Life uh, series, my, mainly because I thought that a lot of the really effective tools for sleep were just not affordable. I wanted to democratize sleep. And simple little moves like being able to elevate the head of your bed which you can now do with adjustable bed frames, unbelievably effective. By the way, if you're not going to have an adjustable bed frame, at least put two cinder blocks or you know, a couple of thick books under the head's board of your bed. Just elevate the bed a little bit, just the head, because gravity will reduce reflux. It might help with snoring, because one of the things that adjustable bed frames do when they elevate your head is they reduce your snoring. We did a clinical trial on patients to actually demonstrate that. Uh, having the right pillows matters. If you're allergic to down, for example, or you're having issues with some of the synthetic material, it's a problem. We have engineered down that mimics down, but it has no allergies. Those little tactics, weighted blankets, another good example. Some people like to feel cuddly. Chief, you look like a cuddly guy. I, so I'm a you, definitely a cuddly guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hugger too. I, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a hugger. Yeah, so a lot of people want to be cuddled at night. So a weighted blanket that's correctly made will, will make you feel a little bit more cozy. And that'll actually help you sleep better and longer through the night. That way you don't get up at three in the morning feeling like you're out there exposed. Those, these are all things that have been studied by doctors. Uh, the, it's, the National Sleep Foundation's evaluated these concepts. They work. People need to invest the effort. Light's another good example, by the way. Seeing bright light first thing in the morning is really helpful. Go ahead and get some sunlight like I'm getting right now that you can't get in Dallas because it's about to rain. But that actually <laughs> sets your circadian rhythm. So 16 hours after you see bright light, you'll get tired. 
You want that. And at nighttime, you don't want bright lights in your eyes. So you got to turn up electronics that have bright screens for at least half an hour before you go to bed, or else your brain melatonin secretion will, won't be adequate. You won't actually have the chemical support to fall asleep because you don't actually fall asleep. You glide gently into sleep. Oh, gotcha. Got Man, you, you just gave us a ton wow. of life hacks, you know? So I, I just want to let my people know if you ever come to my house and I have cinder blocks underneath my bed frame, don't <laughs> judge me. Dr. Oz said it's, it's good. <laughs> And I love a good weighted blanket. I love, you know, a good set of sheets and just kind of setting the stage for a good night's sleep. And I know that your products, we have a great assortment at shopmyexchange.com. So for everybody watching, it does matter where you shop. So you can check out shopmyexchange.com for more information on the great stuff that Dr. Oz was just talking about. Um, also here at the exchange, you know, we like to promote what we call a beat it lifestyle. So that's eating well is, is a huge part of that. How can we make small changes in our habits, um, our food habits that lead to long lasting results? So I'll, I'll share with you what I've been telling my audience for a couple of years now, and I do it myself, uh, intermittent fasting, but it's not okay. the way you might think it works. You don't have to just you know, starve yourself for 18 hours a day. Uh, for me, intermittent fasting is about delaying your breakfast for just a couple hours. Most people, when they first wake up in the morning, can get pretty comfortable not having anything solid in their belly for a couple hours without too much difficulty. You could have coffee. That's okay. Things with no calories you can have. But instead of having breakfast at six, have it at nine or 10. That little difference makes it, it adds up because that means if you had your dinner, let's say you finished your dinner by 7.30, 8, if you don't have your breakfast until 10, you went 14 hours without eating. That means you're basically in ketosis, usually, if you've had a good dinner, the right kind of dinner. And that allows your body's hormones to work with you, not against you. So it doesn't cost you any money. You can actually eat the same number of calories in a shorter window, and you won't have the same impact in terms of weight gain. It has other benefits in terms of making your mind feel a little fresher, sharper, um, and you actually reduce the inflammatory markers in your blood. All these are good reasons why a lot of great athletes intermittent fast now. They do it because they want to perform at a higher level. We can all do it, whether you're in the military, whether you're a heart surgeon or a TV host, it'll help all of us get there. And I like that idea also because it's not hard to memorize the rules. It's about changing your routine. So you bump back your breakfast a little bit. While I'm talking about food, the, the more the food looks like it looked when it came out of the ground, the better it is for you. Sure. But processed food becomes a big issue. And I know that a lot of times you guys are traveling and you don't get to pick all your own meals, but this is one thing where you probably could have a little influence. The more fresh food that they're able to bring you, and my goodness, you're, you're, you're risking your lives for us. The more fresh food they can bring in, the better it is for all of us. So you are team late breakfast or team no breakfast versus team breakfast. Is that, now, I'm, is that I'm fair? Team late, <laughs> no, what I do personally is I eat a late breakfast uh, around 10. If I don't get around to it, because I'm, let's say I'm doing an operation, I'll just mm. skip breakfast and have lunch. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll always eat something around 12 or one. And I try to eat my dinner as early as possible. I'm not a, my friends all know when I call them for dinner, we're going to eat dinner at six, six 30. I don't, I don't believe in you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. nine o'clock dinners. That's not who no, I am. Me neither. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the sleep that you get before midnight is more valuable than the sleep after midnight. Oh. So the earlier you can go to bed, you're better off going to bed at 9, 30, 10 and getting up at 5, 36 than the same number of hours, but from 12 to eight in the morning. That's interesting. interesting. I'll, try, I'll try that tonight. I'll try to try to hit the hay around 9, 30 and see how that plays out. <laughs> and I, I usually don't eat breakfast super early either. So like today I haven't eaten yet. It's 11, 20 here. So I have been following your guidance, um, <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> but, but I feel validated. I feel validated now. Like, yes, this, this had a purpose. Hmm. So uh, Dr. Oz, the last of that performance triad is activity. Um, do you have any tips on how to make daily exercise a habit for some of us who maybe don't right now? <laughs> you know, I've gotten into a routine uh, throughout my life of first thing in the morning before I do anything else, doing exercise. Now, I know that's sometimes difficult to get into your schedule, but let's be honest. The only time you really control is the first thing in the morning. And are you willing to admit your life is so out of control, you don't have 10, 15 minutes for yourself? So I get up and I do a yoga routine. I literally have a I have playlist on my phone. I learned how to do enough yoga moves that I can do it for you know 30 minutes. But you don't have to go 30 minutes. You can do 20 minutes or whatever you have time for. I used to do seven minutes every morning when I was really busy. And it would just be calisthenics and some sun salutation, which is, a, again, a basic yoga tool. By the way, all these yoga moves that I'm talking about, they're all on DrOz.com. You guys can just, okay. I'll give you the video, put them on your sites. 
They're super simple and straightforward. And they're all things that will make your body feel alive. But I find that morning activity will both get me proud about the rest of my day because every everyone else is not exercising. I'm looking around saying, I got this. I already did it. <laughs> uh, I'm not having the dread doing exercise at the end of the day. But also I find that it wakes me up and gets me sharp. And again, I'm not, I don't have to do anything crazy exorbitant. I just need to make sure I'm stretched out with a little bit of strength building activity. And when you're doing that, you'll end up sweating a little bit, but you don't need a lot. There's the, the, the difference between sweating for 10 minutes a day. Think about this. Sweating 10 minutes a day and not is gargantuan. It dwarfs, dwarfs the, the difference between 10 minutes and 20 minutes of activity or 10 minutes and an hour of activity. That first 10 minutes is the most important by far. So don't think you got to get an hour every morning and you're going to feel exhausted when you get, because that's not sustainable for a lot of people. Just focus on making something that you can automate, do every single morning, never let anything get in your way. And then that becomes your routine. That's what we find is true when you look at people who live a long time. People who live in so-called blue zones where the chance of getting to age 100 is four times more common than if you live in Dallas or frankly anywhere in this country. Those people get daily activity. It's just, they get, they get up in the morning, they go pick up the bucket, they get the, the well water out, they carry it back home again. That's their exercise. But they do it every day, even when they're 90 or 100. Yeah. So so I, I'm, I'm looking at yoga and I'm, I'm feeling like I need to be a little bit more limber because like, like recently I've been uh, going to the physical therapist because I've been having some lower back pain. And so, uh, and there, they're, they're trying to work on my core and they're also stretching, stretching my legs. And I, I'm about as limber as a graham cracker right now. So, so it's just, it, <laughs> I, I can't get too, too much going on. So I'm just trying to, trying to do the right, as far as trying to get into yoga, I just know I got to get looser. And so I'll be, I'll be working on that. Definitely. But chief, let me ask you, can, when you lean over, can you touch your hands to your knees? Yes. All right. Are there are a lot of people listening right now who cannot. So I know you're joking about being as, as, lim as, lim as limber as a graham cracker, which I'm going to steal that. But you'll be hearing that the Dr. Oz show. Yes. Ah, I have it. arrived. You heard Trademark it here that. first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm but, kidding. but a lot, a lot of folks think they got to be able to put their, you know, their hands under their feet. You don't have to do that. You get, you know, it, you, you will over the course of about two weeks dramatically change your ability to bend over, and for lower back pain, which I happen to have as well, uh, it's the number one tip that I always tell young surgeons because surgeons are always crouched over like this. And so we get, mm -hmm. you know, kyphotic and we get neck pain and back pain. It's the number one reason surgeons retire early is they have back pain. So I'm sure it's true in the military. It's the number one cause of lost work days. So just getting up in the morning, first thing and gently, not pushing, without popping, just gently reaching forward and touching your toes or your knees or your calves, wherever you get, that, that in itself will limber you up and allow you to move around without discomfort during the day. Now, these sound so simple. You think, oh, God, why wouldn't they do it? Well, we don't. I mean, yeah, think yeah. about it. We just don't do it. You know, you get up 10 minutes late, you think you're rushed. You're better off being five minutes late with a, with a loose back because you'll function better. Absolutely. And so uh, I recently uh, was on a, a podcast and, and I talked about um, kind of the being on the show and, and, and the stuff that kind of uh, really surprised me. I just, I'm really surprised. And I guess I'm not surprised. I just, it just, I see a lot of great things that people do in the world. Uh, and I think it gets kind of overshadowed by a bunch of negativity, but there's a lot of good people doing a lot of great things. So I just want to kind of highlight, uh, you just recently had a medical experience uh, where you had an emergency situation at the airport where you helped somebody, uh, you know, that, that I guess he was having a heart issue or so, some something like that. Can you tell us kind of what happened and, and how did you react to that situation? Well, I was uh, way away from luggage. You know, never check luggage. So we're at the luggage claim area, and my uh, one of my my daughters, Yami, yells, "Daddy, Daddy!" And it's that kind of alarming sound in her voice that any father recognizes. So I quickly turned to see what was happening. A man had collapsed at her feet. He was face forward. He'd smacked his head on the ground, and I only bring that up uh, because when you fall and hit your head that hard, it means you really had actually died before you hit the ground. You oh. lost consciousness because mm -hmm. no one bangs their head if they're partly conscious. So there was blood pooling around his head. I knew he was already out. I checked for a pulse, nothing, breathing, nothing. So basically he was dead. And the unfortunate reality is in that situation, unless you've got the right equipment, it's very hard to save those people. It's probably at most a 20% chance of survival. But he was at Newark Airport, which is if you're going to drop dead, that's the right place to do it. Because there were some wonderful Newark Port Authority police who were nearby. Uh, and uh, I, I, I quickly started doing chest compressions. 
And I, when I ripped the shirt apart to do the chest compressions, there was a big scar down his chest. So I knew he'd had a heart surgery, which is my specialty. So I knew that there was a heart reason, <clears throat> most likely that it caused him to drop dead. And officer Croissant, this Newark officer came over and said, can I help? I can do chest compressions. So I let him do chest compressions and I went and started doing the airway, trying to get oxygen into his patient. Meanwhile, another police officer brought me a defibrillator. Another one brought me a device to use to open up his mouth. <clears throat> and so with all this stuff working, we were able to shock him back. And we got this man with a pulse again. And within 10 minutes, he was beginning to wake up. We got an ambulance there, which they'd already called. Uh, got him to the closest hospital in Newark. And, and they were able to open up a closed blood vessel and saved his life. Now, there are a couple of lessons here. First, as the officer Croissant to kneel down to help me, he had never done CPR before oh, and a person, wow. but he had taken the class. So what he said was right. He knew what to do. He just never done it before, but he was brave enough to put his hand up and say, I studied, I did my work. I learned how to do chest compressions, which I'm going to teach everyone right now. You basically pump a hundred times a, a minute. That's like staying alive, staying alive. Hi. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, I was, I was hoping he had watched the office episode where he was uh, doing the right. staying alive. Uh, that's right. That's a great episode. But you just sing a song that's got a fast cadence. You press down about two inches. If you break a rib, it doesn't matter because you're better off having a patient who's alive with a busted rib that gets better in a couple of weeks than someone who's dead, whose ribs are perfect. Right. So simple stuff. You keep going until someone pushes you away and says, I know how to do it better than you. And what Officer Croissant did was life saving. Because by freeing me up he, and keeping the, the, the chest compression strong, he did something that he was trained to do, which means any of us right now, listen right now on this Facebook Live, can learn how to do chest compressions. And here's the thing the life of the person you save is going to be someone you love. Why? That's who you spend time with. 90% of the time, 91 actually, the number of, that's the percentage of time that someone that, that drops dead drops dead in someone in, like, that, who, with whom they love. That's your spouse, your dad. That's who dies in front of you. So if you know CPR, you can save their life. Call 911, do the chest compressions, get a defibrillator, simple, easy to slap the patches on. It tells you what to do. It shocks the patient after diagnosis. You can't cause harm. It won't shock the patient. It doesn't need the shock. This device shocked him. And then after it was, he was better, it didn't shock him anymore. It said, we have regular rhythm. And so the guy came on my show. He just texted me before this episode. It's before we just went on live. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> he, he, his, uh, his wife's a pistol. The, 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 the person who's going to save his life, his name is Joe, is his wife. Because she is after him now. She's going to get him to lose weight, exercise, all of the things, sleep better, uh, all the things we're talking about. And he's in a rehab program and he's done fantastically well. That is amazing. You were in the right place at the right time along with those first responders in Newark. Congratulations. So cool, too, that you were able to have them on your show and, and reunite in that way. Well done. Well, I loved it. And uh, actually, the governor of our state called um, a little while later, just coincidentally, and, and Joan happened to be next to me and Officer Croissant as well. So everyone got congratulated for doing their job. But I'm most proud of the Newark police officers because I'll tell you, quick, I didn't share this with folks on public yet, but the reason they're so good at CPR in that airport is there was a nurse who was, a, was an officer. And she insisted that she teach her, her colleagues how to do CPR. Not even, again, you can teach someone in five minutes how to do CPR. And she was a first responder at, at, on September 11th and she died in the towers. Oh, wow. So oh, there's, wow. A, there's a, 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 an award that they give under her name. Uh, but we wanted to celebrate her because without her guidance 20 years ago, these officers would not have been able to seamlessly function and save Joe's life. Man, that's awesome. Wow. That's a great story. Mm. And uh, and amazing that your your daughter was able to alert you to what was happening as well. So, well, Arabella is interesting because she never you know, she's a she's a therapist she's like a psychologist, but she'd never seen someone die before, and so there was this weird. She was observing the people we all I think you know around everyone was sort of. I mean, most people listening now have never actually seen someone who shouldn't have died die in front of them. You, you'll sometimes see a loved one who's older who's passing from a, you know a bad cancer or old age. But this was, in this case, you know, a 60 year old healthy guy or healthy looking guy. And I, I, I think most people don't realize how weird that is, how soul sapping it is to watch another human life ebb away. We're, we're God's creatures. We have a divine spark in us. We're special and unique. We're not supposed to go before our time. So when you have the opportunity, uh, which is what CPR gives you to intervene and do something of that magnitude. And there's a good reason these police officers felt so appropriately proud of their training. They weren't, they weren't even proud of themselves. They were proud of the fact that they were part of a team that knew how to do this correctly. 
Amazing. Dr. Oz, we have soldiers, airmen, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members, military families joining us from all around the world. Um, what words of hope or encouragement can you share with our nation's heroes today? I'm, I'm more optimistic now than I have been in a long time, in part because I've been talking to a lot of my colleagues overseas, and people really want us to lead. They desperately want America to be that shining city on a hill. They see this crazy experiment that started you know, 250 years ago that's still going strong, the ability for people to, to respect each other, lead each other, and uh, allow folks with incredible talents to thrive, to be a home for people from all over the planet who came here. My parents immigrated here, and they wanted to be part of the American landscape, part of the American experiment. And I think that our people recognize that. And you're the, you're the first responders for our country. You know, being our, our agents overseas, making sure folks realize that we care about them. And I think as our country leads the path towards vaccination, and outside of Israel, I think we're, we're the top vaccinated country in the world. And we're, for that reason, starting to have a surplus of vaccines. We're going to start sharing those vaccines with other countries and allowing them to get the same safety, save their lives like we've been able to get our lives safe. And it's a tribute to American ingenuity that our, our, our companies have been able to to, manuf to create, manufacture, and distribute these vaccines so rapidly. It's the same technology that's gonna save lives all over the world. And they should be, all of our armed forces should be very proud that we'll save lives in a very different way than we normally do. Oh, thank you for that. I know the troops appreciate your, your comments on them and, and their service. Wanted to pause for a second and turn to our live Facebook feed and share some of the viewer feedback with you. So like Leah said, we have folks watching from all over the world. Uh, we have Carolyn watching from Jacksonville, Florida. Jerome says hello from Colorado. Um, Tag is in the Navy and he's watching from Virginia Beach. And he is wanting to know if you think if the uh, COVID vaccine, if that will become an annual shot like the flu shot, is that something we're going to have to look at getting a booster of every year? We're not sure yet. The, uh, the head of Merck believes yes. He said, looking at the data, I think there's going to be variants of the virus because it's still reproducing around the world. Mm -hmm. And some of those variants will mutate so far away from what we vaccinated against that it'll require an extra booster shot, sort of like what happens with the flu. Sure. But uh, there's also the possibility that we won't be as protected. Our immune system won't be as strong a year from now as it is now after vaccination. But I don't want people to focus on that right now. We don't know. You know, vaccines only, you know, five months old. So how can you possibly make predictions accurately at 12 months? I can give you my best guess. But I, I suspect based on prior infections like COVID-19 that have had vaccinations made or that had actual data on what happens to people who've gotten the actual illness, that we're going to have immune strength that goes beyond a year against the current strains. It's possible that the variants might be different enough that we'll need boosters, but I'm hoping that is not a, a continuous event. If it happens next year or maybe another year after that, but at some point we'll have enough people protected against COVID that it won't reproduce that quickly. And so we won't have that many variants, not that many mutations. So we won't have to get continuous boosters. Okay. Thank you for that perspective. Um, also wanted to share that Army Family and MWR programs, they say hello, Dr. Oz, and that they're gonna share this interview with their community. Um, we have, let's see, people commenting on sleep. They love their sleep. Uh, they love weighted blankets. Um, Maddie says the Dr. Oz Good Life Sleep System has changed my life. So there you go, changing <laughs> lives again. Thank you, Maddie. And, uh, <laughs> people commenting mm -hmm. on mobility, how important mobility is to longevity and um, hanging in there with that. Um, Can I say one thing about mobility? I don't know who, who's, yeah. who, sent, that, who sent that message in. You see oh, it there? I think I just, it just went right by. Um, okay, okay. Well, Cindy, whoever... Her name is Cindy, Cindy okay. Neidner. So, so Cindy, let me I offer a little bit of advice here. I, don't do things for your older relatives that they can do for themselves. You know, let them carry their luggage within reason. Let them walk up the stairs by themselves. Don't, don't try to get in their way because the activities of daily living is what keeps them limber, keeps them mobile because they're not going to go jogging on the track with you. So I try to emphasize to my friends, if you really love your parents, let them do some stuff for themselves. They'll, it, it benefits them long-term. They'll sleep better at night too. Oh, wow. Good that advice. is something I had not considered. That's really yeah. great advice. My, my mom and dad are set to visit next week. They can carry their own luggage in the house. Exactly. <laughs> I'll say, Dr. Oz said, mom, you got this. You got this. So, so we, 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 
No, go ahead. Go ahead, Leah. Oh, sorry, Chief. There was a question from Chief's page. Uh, Master Sergeant Thomas says that he has had some trouble with sleeping um, over the last few nine years. Um, he says he goes to bed between 10 p.m. and midnight. Majority of the time, he's waking up in the middle of the night, having a hard time falling back to sleep. Um, do you have any uh, any tips or any information for him? So a couple of uh, realities. A, a lot of people have trouble falling asleep at night, but probably a similar number wake up too early and can't get back to sleep again. And the main reason for the latter group is one of two things. Ruminations, your mind is racing and it wakes you up, or you have physical discomfort, restless leg, back pain, neck pain, something wakes you up, snoring from your spouse, the pet jumps on your leg, things like that. So you wanna focus on both. If there's ambient noise, you get a sleep machine, they work. Uh, if, you, if your legs are hurting, you to, actually these, these adjustable bed frames really do help with back pain and lower leg discomfort. So you can elevate your legs a little bit, that helps a lot of people, but you need to find out what it is. And the best way to do that, I think, is to use some of these a free sleep monitoring system. Sleep score is a good one that uh, we started with some friends, but it's free. You just download the app and you set it. It's got a, your phone has got a little sonar system here, like a dolphin. And so if you just lay the phone about five feet from your bed, it'll scan you at night and in the morning give you a report card. Whether you are moving too much, was your brain away, was your body away, just to give you an idea of what's going down. And then use that to guide why you think you're waking up. Uh, chief, you know, three in the morning, four in the morning. The other little tip is before you go to bed at night, just spend five minutes writing down the things that are bothering you. Just write them down. And the reason for that is you can't fix them while you're asleep anyway, but your brain's going to try all night long to fix them. So by writing them down, you know, you're not going to forget them. When you get up first thing in the morning, you'll have some fresh ideas to think about these issues. We've all got problems. I don't care. I mean, I, I know a lot of famous people. I know a lot of rich people. I know a lot of powerful people. We all probably do, right? They all have the same issues. We're, we all got things to worry. We're worried about our kids, worried about our jobs, worried about the future, we, about what we said yesterday. I mean, everyone's got issues where our brains are so complicated with this beautiful cortex that, that wraps around the limbic, the reptilian part of the brain. It, that, that brain got that size. So we can read each other, so we can process information, so we can read between speak. We can see subtle face movements, but it also gives us too much information, too much going on in there. And for many people, the most dangerous place is inside their head. So by writing down what's going on, then, you know, you can get nine years worth of sleep back if that's really your issue. Yeah. So, I, and I have another question as well. Um, Cause we, we had a, we had a, uh, we got a chance to do, uh, interview a Medal of Honor recipient. He was like 93 years old uh, and he's sharp as a tech. I think he was like 93, right? Julie or somewhere around yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, sharp as a tech. And we always ask him, what's the secret to, to, to long? And so he gave us this, this recipe that kind of revolves around apple cider vinegar. And so he takes a shot with a, a bunch of other things uh, included into it. He said he takes it every day and he's like, well, that's my secret. That's what he gives to all these other folks. He gives everybody. <laughs> Matter of fact, he sent us a, a, a coin and the recipe for his apple cider vinegar uh, 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 elixir that, that, that has kept him alive <laughs> for, not for 93 years. I'll tell you, since you bring it up, Chief, um, there was, a, when I was a young doctor, there was a very, uh, handsome, incredibly healthy looking 80 year old guy who was an artist. And I asked him what his secret was. And he said the exact same thing. He was from Kentucky. He said his mommy, this is now she's, she was probably, you know, this goes back a hundred years now. Cause he was, you know, he was, he was 80 at the time. Um, she, she would always tell him, take a shot of apple cider vinegar and then get another shot and splash it on your face. Now, apple cider vinegar is the number one home remedy in America. I talk about it in the show a lot because people use it. And I'm curious, what do they find useful? So first off, it is a toner on your face, inexpensive. It's, you know, so wow. it, there's probably some value just sort of firming your face a little bit. It's a little bit like, like an, imagine like a, a little bit of an acid peel, but a gentle one. So it doesn't really cause much of a of damage. So that, that's the face part. But when you drink it, it does a couple of things. It does change the acidity of your stomach, obviously, but it also is probably healthy for the bacteria in your gut. And that may be one of the reasons that it, by allowing our, our, the microflora in our gut to, to thrive, that biome can now mature. And remember, we don't really digest our own food. We outsource digestion to a bacteria in our gut. We've got 10 times more gut bacteria than cells in our body, 10 times more. So we're actually not, we're mostly not us. 
all those bacteria do a lot of important things for us. So by feeding them the right things, which is what I think apple cider vinegar does, you're helping out. Now, prebiotics can be kimchi, sauerkraut. There are lots of foods that have, pro, that have I'm sorry, probiotics that have bacteria in them. And there are lots of foods that are good for those bacteria that feed those bacteria. Those are called prebiotics. So you want to eat a diet like the ones that our parents would have normally given to us if they wanted to eat healthily, that naturally gives you those bacteria as well. Awesome. Awesome, man. Look, look. Yeah, Chief Chat viewers, you guys are getting all kind of just goodness <laughs> and, and life hacks and, and just jewels that, that we're dropping. So thank you so much, Dr. Oscar. Uh, besides, so besides your talk, talk show, can you talk about any other products that you're working on? Uh, we'd love to know more. Well, you're very kind. I'm, I'm working on a program called Health Core. It's, we, it's a, almost 20 years old. We raised close to $100 million for it. This goes in the schools around the country and teaches kids about health. Now, you know how the Peace Corps takes college grads, energetic young people, and gives them some education about how to build dams, for example, yeah. and he puts them in Botswana as you can build dams. Mm -hmm. We take those same college grads, we teach them how to teach, and we teach them about health. Then we put them in high schools around the country. And so if folks want to be Health Corps volunteers, you can reach out to healthcorps.org. Uh, it's a great foundation. We're working with a lot of fantastic groups to build clubs now around the country where kids, teens can get together and focus on what they can do to get their communities healthier, get themselves healthier, be friends that they're supportive of each other. And I love the fact that they get, there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, you sort of empower young people to realize they can be change agents, that they can make a difference. And I want a lot of these young people to go into health. Uh, we've actually used, you know, Health Corps helped us with the hashtag more black doctors campaign. You know, we don't, we only, only 5% of the doctors in America are black. And the best way to get people to listen is to give pe people advice from people who are like them, because you listen, because you, you can identify your cultural similarities. You can break through the, the crusty outside that we all have and actually get people to understand why taking care of your blood pressure matters. And so we want we wanted to, to increase the number of black doctors and by getting the more young people who never thought about health as a career uh, to, to come into the field, that's one of the ways we'll do it. So Health Course uh, spearheads a lot of those efforts. And so anyone wants to participate Please, uh, please go to our website. You know, again, we're always looking for promising young people. And I think service, uh, especially for kids as they graduate high school, is a huge opportunity for our country. A lot of other nations have forced inscription, right? You have to go to the armed forces mm -hmm. uh, without choice. I think it's a great move for a lot of young people. But if you don't want to be in the military, but you want to take a year and see the country and volunteer to play a, a role, uh, when I say volunteer, I think you should get paid. Like we, we pay these young people, but come volunteer. Uh, we're not going to pay you a lot, but we pay you more than enough to live. And we're also going to get you to see the country. So you can go off and do, do great works. If not with us, with AmeriCorps, Teach for America. There are great programs out there. But I think having a national volunteer program that allows you to, to spend a year meeting your brethren, your generation, and, and then maybe we'll give you some stipends to go to college afterwards. We'll give you a little financial support for a couple of years uh, just to sort of jumpstart your, your, your life. That, those are the things that I think as Americans we'd be proud to support. Absolutely. So Dr. Oz, for our viewers, and as a reminder, the sleep products that you mentioned earlier, those can be found on shopmyexchange.com, but where can our audience go to follow you and find out more information on your work and what you have going on? I've got one of the most memorable names. It's certainly one of the shortest out there. So <laughs> you, can go to, you search Oz, you'll find me anywhere you go, but Dr. Oz, uh, is my handle for uh, Facebook. We've got about 6 million people there, 4 million on Twitter, a bunch of people on Instagram and uh, uh, TikTok. I mean, all the major social sites you'll have us, but DrRoz.com mm -hmm. is the main website. And we have lots of content that is high quality, curated, very thoughtful, accurate, that I think will be beneficial to a lot of folks. I think they want to make sense of the world around them. So Dr. Oz, we, I want to <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Also, like, I, I can't remember a, a, a show that, Kind of revolved around health of uh, me growing up like I just, I just don't remember that ever happened so I want to thank you for for creating a platform that is that became super popular and it lasted over a decade uh that is you know solely focused on you know keeping us alive for a little bit longer so I think you know you round of applause for that man you that, that is awesome awesome uh well, you were awesome. kind but I, I gotta say I gotta I'm gonna pay this forward uh Oprah Winfrey and I, t I went to Oprah University for you know five six years which that's what we called it uh, going on our show all the time <laughs> And Gail King, another great mentor of mine, uh, they have done a wonderful job opening my eyes to the possibility that America had a voracious appetite for health information and also showed me how to, how to teach it. So as you know, like everything else uh, that you guys do, it's about a big team that cares for each other. And I'm, I've been blessed with, the, I think, the best team in television and the smartest audience in TV. 
because these guys, there's a website. I don't know if you know this, Chief. It's called IHateDrOz.com. Oh, it started, no. it, started, it started by husbands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> their, their wives, they get home and wife says, Dr. I said no more to kill Basa for you. <laughs> they, well, that's enough barbecue for you. No more soft drinks for you. I'm not getting any more pretzels. And soon all the fun things that they look forward to were gone. And so they, they, caught, they came together. I had them on my show, actually. They're, they're hilarious. <laughs> but I, well, what I really treasured was getting to the change agents, getting to the people who make a difference in their communities, the people who uh, are listened to. And that's what you guys represent. I don't know if you appreciate it because sometimes you never, you know, you're never a prophet in your own land, but people in the military have an inordinate respect in our nation. We trust what you tell us. We know you're doing the right thing. You risked your lives for our nation. You love the country arguably more than anybody else could possibly love a country because you're risking your lives for it. So we listen to you. So go out there and keep, keep not only keep safe, but keep spreading the wisdom of what America represents. Absolutely. And so here at the military and definitely exchange, uh, we love DrOz.com. We, 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 we're going to start that for you. So, uh, but we appreciate you sharing your time and your thoughts with our, our airmen, our soldiers, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members from around the world. Uh, we, we, we're supportive of you. We, we, you know what I'm saying? We have your products in our stores, and we, we definitely appreciate what you're doing for the world. But uh, I, I, I got a, um, uh, after the live show, I'm going to get some information from you. I got a, I got a gift for you. So uh, All thank right. you so much for your time and, uh, and uh, Chief Chat out. Chief Chat out. Thanks, Dr. Oz. God bless you too.